good morning. It's good to see you. Have to fight, fight through the clouds. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. For I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. So glad for that truth. Oh, the prodigal is welcome home. The sinner now is saved. For the God who died came back to life, and everything has changed. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, fear, where is your power? The mighty King of kings has disarmed you. Delivered and redeemed, eternal life is ours. Oh, praise His name forever. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Jesus, we thank you for rising. Thank you for conquering death, conquering sin for us. And on the day you call me in to heaven's sweet embrace, I'll see your scars, your open arms, the beauty of your face. And through tears of joy, I lift my voice in everlasting praise. Hallelujah, Christ is risen from the grave. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, fear, where is your power? The mighty King of kings has disarmed you. Delivered and redeemed, eternal life is ours.
What great news. What a great story. What a great truth to hang our hearts on this day. Christ is indeed risen from the grave. I know it's not Easter Sunday, but that's okay. We can celebrate this any day, any time. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, beloved, scattered all over the place, it's so good to know that we are still together in Jesus. What a blessing that is. Um, and I, I have a, an announcement that's, that's kind of new here, but we've decided to do something totally different on Easter. Whether we're meeting here or not, it's just going to be a ton of fun, and that is this. We're going to have a virtual choir. And you're saying, well, what in the world is a virtual choir? It's really simple. For those of you that are already in the choir, you have the music, you have the recordings. So what we want to do is we want to have you play the recording and sing along with it and have someone shoot a video of you singing along. And then you're going to upload the video, and then we're going to take all of those videos and put them together and make a choir. So if you would like to do that and you're not part of the choir, but you still want to have fun doing that, you're certainly invited to do so. Send me an email. It's rick hwcf.org, and we'll get you all the information that you need. And we're going to just, you want to get that done this week, we're going to put a deadline of, on it of uh, next Sunday. So looking forward to that. And uh, Pastor Gary is going to share, share some other stuff if I don't trip over my tongue in the process. Pastor Gary. Hello church, my name is Gary Buck and I'm the lead pastor here at Hopewell and I am so glad that you decided to join us wherever you are. And even though we can't meet together in person, there are things that we can do to create community. Would you please help us by doing something really simple? Wherever you are, take a picture of you or maybe your, you and your whole family watching the service this morning and post your picture on your favorite social media platform and use the hashtag Hopewell Overson. That way we can see all of you and your smiling faces and we can connect with you in a way. Over this next hour, we're going to have our adult service and then at 11 o'clock, our children's pastor, Kobe Martin, will be bringing a message for the kids or for those of you who are kids at heart. We have a ton of exciting things happening online right now. And if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to our YouTube page. And if you click on the little bell button, you'll be alerted when we release new videos. We are creating videos for kids as well as adults. As the world is changing, we are about to worship a God who does not change. We're going to worship him through the word, through song, through our giving. And speaking of giving, thank you so much to all of you who have been giving faithfully during this time. I know that for me, it takes an extra measure of faith and trust in God to give to the Lord when things feel uncertain, but I believe in his promises. There are a few ways that you can give. You can give through our church website, hopewellchurch.org. You can give through our church app. If you don't already have the app, just search for Hopal Elberson in the App Store. And if you try to give online but the system glitches a little bit, just try again later this afternoon after the traffic slows down. And if you like to do things the old-fashioned way, you can always just mail your checks to the church office. So thank you again for your faithfulness to the Lord, and I'm just praying that God will bless you many times over for all the ways you give to Him, and not just financially. Also, if you have any prayer needs at all, please email us at prayer at hopalchurch.com. Dot org. Prayer at hopefulchurch.org. Let me just pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this day that you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you for all the ways that you have blessed us, that you have given to us for your many gifts in our lives. And Lord, we thank you for all of your promises, and right now, we are standing on your promises. And for each person and family who uh, is giving right now to you, uh, especially right now we're just thinking about financially, Lord, I just pray you would bless them according to your promises and, and your word. Um, Lord, I pray that uh, each of us could give to you whatever you're calling us to give. Again, not just with finances, but maybe in calling a neighbor, um, taking someone a meal, whatever this looks like during this time. Lord, help us to get our eyes off of our own needs and more onto the needs of others and just uh, that you would just fill us with thankfulness. Thankful for all that you are and all that you've done for us, God. And uh, may we seek your kingdom first. So we bless you today. We bless you in all that we do here. And may we bring your name, Jesus Christ, honor and glory. Your name be lifted up above every other name. And it's in that name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. 
Well, now I would like to turn things over to our worship pastor, Rick Taylor, who will bring us an important and I believe timely word from the Lord today. And I really believe that's going to minister to each of your hearts wherever you are. God bless. Well, hey there, church. These are certainly uncertain times, aren't they? Do you, do you find yourself like drawn to check the news over and over again? Just so you can kind of feel like you know what's going on. I don't know if you guys remember this. Um, sorry, I got to take these things out of my ears. We got to do that. I don't know if you guys remember this, but at, about uh, maybe six months after September 11th, 2001, there was another plane crash in Queens, New York. Do you guys remember that? And I was frantic that day trying to find out what was going on because I had to know, is this, is this a, another terrorist attack or what's happening? And you know, at that point in time, internet news was in its infancy and I didn't have access to TV at work and the radio news was just not filling the void. So for the whole day, I was in panic. But you know what? My, my, my panic, it didn't help me at all. It really didn't help me at all. All it did was give me a really bad night of sleep, and I was groggy the next day. And uh, I eventually learned through the news that it was a mechanical failure. It was not a terrorist attack, and life went on just fine. So what I wish I would have known then that I know now is that in uncertain times, I need peace far more than I need information. I need peace far more than I need information. I need the untouchable peace that we've been talking about for a few weeks here, right? Instead of rushing to the news, I should have been rushing to what Pastor Gary was talking about um, last week, right? Uh, this kingdom first challenge that he put out there, right? When you get up, go right to God. I should have gone right to God. I should have dove into his word and read because in God we find peace. In the world, we find chaos, right? It's nuts out there, especially now, right? But in God, we find peace. And God's peace is so, uh, so solid that the chaos of the world can't touch it. It can't affect it. That's why it's unshakable, unshakable, untouchable peace. When I was 12, uh, my older brother Keith was killed in a car accident. And a few weeks before he died, he went on a retreat with the youth group. And the youth group was led by a couple of really Bible-based, uh, charismatic priests, awesome, awesome men of God. And as part of the weekend, the students were asked to finish this phrase. When everything goes wrong, I blank. And here's how my brother finished that phrase. When everything goes wrong, I run to God. He knew better at 17 than I knew at 35. Run to God, what great advice. And isn't that essentially what Pastor Gary was teaching last week? Seek first the kingdom of God. I know it's a really loose translation, but isn't run to God pretty much the same thing? Seek first, run to God. 
So today we're going to talk about running to God, what that might look like, seeking God. Um, Because in hard times, seeking God first isn't natural. I mean, we naturally search for answers to our problems. We naturally try to solve those problems in our own strength. That's natural. Peace during the struggle, that's not natural at all. See, during hard times, peace is supernatural. It comes from outside of us. It comes from beyond nature. It comes from beyond our own capabilities. In hard times, we need supernatural peace. We need supernatural understanding, and we get that by running to God, seeking God first. And we run to God in many ways, but one of the ways that we run to God is by worshiping him. You know, it's, it's easy to worship when things are going well, isn't it? You know, when you get that house that you've been dreaming about, or, you know, everyone in your family, everyone you love is healthy, or you get that guitar that you've had your eyes on. Maybe that's just me. Maybe the guitar part is just me. But, you know, it's like worshiping then is so easy because everything is going good and everything feels good. It's like, oh, Lord, thank you. And that's important to worship in gratitude in those times. But, see, in the scriptures, we were never instructed to worship as part of our circumstances. The scripture does not say worship the Lord when life is going great. Look at King David. Consider King David. We all know King David, the sling, right? Kills the giant, the giant comes down, he becomes the king. David becomes the king. And he has this really horrible episode in his life where he sees this beautiful woman who is married to another man. He takes her and uh, she becomes pregnant, and he has her husband killed, and then he takes her as his wife. It's a horrible time in David's life. And in that process, after that's all done, the result of that union is a little boy, and the child is born. And then God speaks through a prophet to David and tells David that that child, because of David's sin, that child is going to die. And what does David do in response? Does he shake his fist? God, how could a loving God do that to me? No. You know what David does? He worships for a whole week. He lays flat on his face. He doesn't eat. He doesn't sleep. He is pleading with God for the life of that child. And after a week, the child dies. And all the people that serve David in the, in the, in the palace there, they're terrified. They're like, well, how do we tell him? He was bad when the child was still living. <laughs> how, what's going to happen now that the child died? And David actually overhears their whispers, and he says, is the child dead? And, of course, you don't lie to the king. So, the, yeah, yes, King David, he, the child's dead. And what does David do then? He gets up. He takes a shower. He puts on lotions. He gets himself ready for the workday. And then he goes back and worships some more, and he bows down before God to adore God, to praise him. In the worst of times, losing a child. Or think about Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas are beaten, they are scourged, and then they're thrown in jail. And they're sitting in this Greek jail with no idea what the future holds for them other than that they're in the Lord's hand. And what do they do? I mean, they're bleeding probably still. What do they do? They sing. They sing hymns. They sing songs about God. And the scripture tells us that all the prisoners were listening to them. And it was sometime late in the evening. They worshiped in some of the hardest times. And there are so many in the Bible, Abraham and David and Paul and Silas, and so many that that respond in worship to hard times. So how do we do that? And why do we do that? We are instructed in Scripture to worship God alone. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus says this. It is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So this is when the devil comes and tempts Jesus. Excuse me. So the devil comes and shows Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and says, if you'll worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. And Jesus' response is, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And Jesus is paraphrasing a scripture in Deuteronomy way back at the beginning of the Bible. And that is a command for the nation of Israel to worship the true God, the God that freed them from, from Egypt's slavery. It's a command 
Worship the Lord your God. It's not a suggestion, it's a command. And in John chapter 4, Jesus is having a conversation with a Samaritan woman at a well. And they get into this little bit about worship. The Samaritans say you do this, and Jews say you do this. And Jesus tells her this. God is spirit, and his, spirit, and his worshipers must worship. They must worship in spirit and in truth. Another command. So what does it mean to worship the Lord your God or to must worship in spirit and truth? What does that mean? Well, Pastor Gary and, and others from this platform over the years have talked about how the New Testament, where, where John and where Luke, the two scriptures we just looked at, where they came from, it's written in Greek. Not in English, right? It's written in Greek. And there's a Greek word that is used a lot. It is most commonly translated as worship. And the word is proskunio. And that's the word that is used in those two scriptures, Luke 4 and John 4, proskunio. And literally, it means to kiss. But this is not a romantic kiss. This is not a husband and wife kiss. This is not even a parent-child kiss. This is more like to kiss the hand of the king where you go before his throne and he reaches out his hand and you kiss his ring or you kiss his hand. It is complete submission. It is profound reverence for whom you bow to. Sometimes this word proscunio, it even, it even sometimes includes lying on the ground and kissing the ground out of reverence to somebody. So that's that Greek word and what that means. And when I, when I studied that word, it reminded me of that story in Luke chapter 7 about the woman who she's crying and she's wiping Jesus' feet. So there's this woman, and the scripture explains that she was crying because she knew she was a really bad sinner. And the whole town knew. And for some reason, being in the presence of Jesus brought all of that to light and was more than she could bear. So she cries and she's weeping, and her tears are falling onto Jesus' feet. And I don't know if she was embarrassed or if it was out of respect or reverence. I don't know the whole story, the whole context of it. But I know this much. The scripture says that she got down and with her hair wiped his feet dry from her tears. And then while she was down there, she started to kiss his feet. Prescunio started to kiss his feet. And then she takes expensive perfume and pours it out on his feet. Why? Why did she do that? Was it because Israel was commanded to worship the Lord their God? Of course not. That was an act of the heart. That was a response to Jesus. That was her natural response to him. She was moved in her heart because some worship has something to do with the heart. <laughs> Let me ask you this question. If my wife Justine were to come up and ask for a kiss, and my response would be, okay, if I have to, and I begrudgingly give her a kiss. How is that going to make her feel if I kiss her out of duty? How's that going to make her feel? Now, <laughs> I can assure you nothing like that ever happens in the Taylor household. Okay, Many of you have seen my wife. You know she's an incredibly beautiful woman. It is my distinct pleasure to oblige when she asks for a kiss. And if I take a quick aside here, I have seen a lot of the men in this church. So ladies, I know you don't have the same pleasure that I have. But that's not my point. That's not my point at all. My point is that in marriage, there's an expectation that affection is shown. You know, to love, honor, and cherish, for those of you that said, said your vows a long, long, long time ago and didn't write them yourself. To cherish, to show this, this, this love from the heart. It's an expectation that I'll kiss my wife. And I need to do it from my heart. And it's an expectation to worship God. And I need to do that from my heart. Just, just like Justine deserves the affection that I show her, God deserves my heart as well. And he deserves yours too. You see, and, and Jesus explained this pretty well. Because he was asked, what's the greatest commandment? And he said this from Matthew chapter 22. He said, he's talking to a, an attorney that asked him, you know, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus' response is, Jesus said to him, love the Lord your God with all your heart, 
with all your soul and with all your mind. Love. That's the greatest commandment. So Jesus is saying in, in Luke 4 and in John 4 that we must worship, that it's a command. But here he's saying it needs to flow from a heart of love. It needs to flow from a spirit of love and a mind of love. Worship is an outpouring of love for God. That's what worship is. And there are things that I do for Justine because I love her. Like, I cook some of her her favorite meals. I don't really think they're that good, probably. I think she's just happy that she doesn't have to cook them, and and she's happy to to say, oh, this is wonderful. Maybe she does love them. I don't know. Um, I I shouldn't say that. She wouldn't lie to me. I know that much. When she was uh, diagnosed with a celiac, I went nuts trying to find foods that she could enjoy uh, that wouldn't make her sick. You know what? I even do yard work because I love Justine. I got to tell you folks, I do not like yard work at all. And um, I do it because it's important to Justine and I love her. And I'm sure many, many people can, can explain the same thing. Now, I have to touch on something in worship that we do together. And Pastor Kobe ran a video a couple of weeks ago that kind of approached this. And, and it's this question, because the question in the video was, well, the Bible says I'm supposed to sing, but I don't like to sing. What am I supposed to do? Well, you know what? If you don't like to sing, I understand. Personally, I would rather sing than pray. You see, singing, worship, and singing to God is, is much more natural for me. I'm a musician. When I'm playing, if I'm playing a guitar, or I'm playing the piano, or whatever, it kind of helps keep me focused, and I, can, and I can just really pour my heart out to God. That's just me personally. But the Bible has instructed me to pray. And matter, matter of fact, the Bible says to pray without ceasing, right? So I'm constantly praying throughout the day. I pray far more than I sing. Prayer for me is a discipline. Singing for you may be a discipline. And you may even heard this phrase. If you've heard the phrase, raise your hand. A sacrifice of praise. Have you ever heard that? I know I've heard it throughout um, most of my life. What is a sacrifice of praise? Well, maybe, maybe the sacrifice of praise is you sacrificing your pride. So I have a challenge for you, and this is, it's this. When we worship together in song, even if you don't like to sing, sing out loud. See, the scripture doesn't say if you can sing like John Legend or if you can sing like Kelly Clarkson to sing out. No, because then I'd be silent too, because I can't sing like that. No, the scripture just says sing. So I challenge you to sing, sing loud, and don't worry about what it sounds like. And if you know what, if your kids are laughing at you, let me ask you this, what are you teaching your children? If you're singing with all your might, and they're there thinking, Man, dad can't carry a tune in a bucket, what are you teaching them? That worshiping God is more important than your self-image. Isn't that what you're teaching them? So I would throw that thought out. Now, I'm going to come back. Because over the years that I've been a worship leader, a handful of people have said, you know, I could never believe in a God that makes people worship him. Have you ever heard that thought or that idea? I could never believe in a God that... Why does God command us to worship? Is he made greater by our praises? Is he so insecure that he needs to be reminded over and over of our adoration? What gives? What's up with that? Let me ask you this question after I take a swig. (laughs) Plop. Has your mother ever told you to eat your vegetables? No dessert until you finish your broccoli. I've heard that. Why? What's in it for your mom? Does she feel some great power forcing you to eat your vegetables? Or is she so insecure that she needs us to obey so she feels valued? No. Your mother knows that vegetables are good for you. They're low in fat. They're low in sugar. So she says, eat your vegetables. They're good for you. Matter of fact, moms, here's a hint that I remember from my childhood. Don't tell them it's good for them because that makes it taste worse. Just what I think. That's just my perspective on it. God says, worship me, because he knows it's good for you. You see, 
when we worship God, we get a better sense of who God is. He reveals himself to us in worship. Now, I want to be clear here. God reveals himself to us in many, many ways. He reveals himself extremely clearly in Scripture, words to read. He reveals himself in prayer. He reveals himself in nature. He reveals himself any way that he wants. He can reveal himself because he is actually the living God, so he can do that. So this is not exclusive to worship, but it happens in worship. When I first started leading worship a long time ago, there was a song that was really popular, and I really liked it, and it goes like this. Oh, magnify the Lord, for he is worthy to be praised. I had this great horn line. Oh, magnify the Lord, for he is worthy to be praised. It's a great song. I loved it, but it confused the daylights out of me. Thinking, how do I make God bigger? Magnify the Lord. What? What does that mean? Well, luckily, I had a very, very good friend who was a professor at a Bible college. So I asked him, I was like, Russ, what gives? What does it mean to magnify the Lord? How can I make God bigger? And I'll never forget his answer. He said, you know, when you look through a microscope, you're looking at one thing very intently, focusing on it and letting everything else drift away. You're focusing on the one thing, and that's what it means to magnify God. Focusing on God and letting everything else disappear. You see, when we focus on God, our troubles, our concerns, our fears, they fall out of view. And the more we focus on God, the greater our understanding of his power, his strength, his love, his forgiveness, his understanding, his grace, his mercy, and the list goes on and on and on. All of the marvelous attributes of the God that we serve. God is magnified. In other words, our view of him is greater as a result, and our struggles are put in their proper place. That's why we worship in hard times. Because when we worship, the stuff of earth gets really, small and we focus on god and he gets really really big and we see who he actually is and we are the better for it just like eating our vegetables that's why we worship god and that's why god tells us to do that we sing a song here uh, called nothing is impossible it's written by a young guy named Corey voss and i love the lyrics to the verses of this song how about this you guys a lot of a lot of people may know this right to the one who made the galaxies What's a storm upon a raging sea? What is sickness to the one who heals? Even death must kneel. Even death must kneel. Do you ever think about those lyrics? I mean, if you can speak a galaxy into existence and you say, exist, and immediately billions of stars appear and planets, and they're all moving and they're doing all sorts of amazing things and it looks stunning. What's a hurricane? I mean, seriously, a storm on one teeny little planet inside a gigantic galaxy? What's that? Or to the God who says, get up and walk, even though you've never walked your whole life. Get up and walk. I've healed you. Or to the blind man, what can you see? <gasps> For the first time in my life, I see. Or to the dead man, Lazarus, come out of the grave. Yeah, you've been dead for four days, and everybody thinks your body is rotten and stinks pretty bad. Come on out, and Lazarus comes out. I got a question for you, church. To that God, what is coronavirus? Okay, I'm not going to say it anymore today because I know we're all tired of hearing about it, but that's the question. Isn't it little and teeny? Come on, teeny compared to our God. That's why we worship because God is greater by far than our circumstances. There's a book that I really enjoy. It's called Essential Worship by a guy named Greg Shear. And he offers this definition of worship. And he says this, worship is tuning ourselves to the Trinity. Worship is tuning ourselves to the Trinity. 
Now, personally, I love this definition. A big part is because of the whole musical connotation. Because like musicians, we tune to a standard pitch. And if we don't all tune, it sounds horrible. If someone's playing not tuned, no matter how good what they're playing with the group, it sounds disgusting. It's bad. Right? You have to tune. So what, we're, what he's saying is that we are tuning to the Trinity. We are tuning ourselves to God. We recalibrate our lives. Maybe that's a good way of saying it. We recalibrate our lives to the perfect pitch of the living God. He says, this is the standard note, and we tune our lives to that. Have you ever heard of sitar? You know, that, that's an instrument from India. Um, it's a pretty amazing instrument. There are anywhere from 18 to 21 strings on a sitar. Yes, there are a lot of strings on a sitar, but only six or seven are played. So if you look really close, there are strings that are higher up here, and they're the ones you play. And then underneath there are strings, and they're called tarb. And you never actually play them. A pick never touches them. But they're tuned to vibrate in sympathy, naturally vibrate with the notes that you're playing. And that's how the sitar gets its great, amazing sound. It's like that droning sound. Right? There's these notes that just kind of ring, and you're playing over top of it. It's an amazing instrument. Well, we can be kind of like a sitar, because if we tune ourselves to God, we vibrate or we move in sympathy to his melody. We vibrate to the notes that he plays. We react as part of his song. We respond to God. In Revelation chapter 1, John has this vision of Jesus. Now, it does not, this vision of Jesus does not look like the guy that walked along the shores of Galilee with John. It was Jesus. He just didn't look quite the same because he was looking at Jesus in heaven in the book of Revelation. Here's how he describes him. John said, he saw someone like a son of man dressed in a long white robe with a golden sash his head and hair were white like snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire, and his feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice like the sound of rushing waters. So what does, what does John do? So in response to this Jesus, John, who knows Jesus, he's actually known as the apostle who Jesus loved. You may have heard that about John before. John fell at Jesus' feet. Proscunio, bowing down, extreme reverence. He worshiped. Later in Revelation, we find John once again falling at someone's feet. This is from Revelation chapter 19. It's verse 9 and 10. And, and John writes this. Well, you know what? I'm just going to give you some background real quick. There's an angel kind of giving uh, John like a guided tour of heaven uh, in this Revelation so there's this angel that's talking to John. So the angel said to John, to me, John, the angel said to John, write this down, John. Blessed are those invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. And then he also said to me, the angel also said to John, these words of God are true. And how did the angel respond? Well, the angel responds by saying, don't, don't do that. Are you kidding me? Do not get down and worship me. He probably said, hey, Lord, I didn't ask him to do this. He's doing this on his own. I am not guilty on this one because we're supposed to worship God alone. The angel says, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers and sisters who hold firm to the testimony of Jesus. See, I think the human response to worship it's natural. I think it just comes out of us. And I think we see it in some pretty clear places. We see it in stadiums all around the world. You know, we see it in concert halls. We see it in response to great music in the concert hall, right? We see it in art galleries. We see it in nature. We respond to what we see and what we hear. And we might shout in excitement, yeah, what a great goal. Or we may clap our hands. Wow, orchestra, that was a beautiful symphony. Thank you. Or we might gasp and exasperation <gasps> wow look at that sunset 
but I believe it's very natural for humans to worship. See, when we focus solely on God, when we magnify him, our responses to him come very, very naturally. And it can be like a snowball effect. You guys can, uh, can imagine that, can picture that, right? The snowball that starts off at the top of the hill and it's not so big and it starts rolling and the snow gets stuck to it and it gets bigger and bigger. And I think what I mean by that is this, that we focus on God and God reveals himself to us. Right? We focus on God and he shows us more of who he is. And then we respond in worship and God shows us even more. And then he reveals more of himself. So this morning as we wrap up our time in the word here, um, we're going to spend some time focusing on God. We're going to use the language of music as a tool so we can lift our voices and our hearts together as one voice. Even though we are spread out all over the world, we can raise our voices as one voice thanks to the technology that God has blessed us with. So let's worship. We'll run to God. We'll seek His kingdom by focusing solely on Him. Because as we focus on Him, the uncertainty of these times and the certainty of His character and His love will fill our hearts. So the uncertainty will fade. But the understanding of God's love will fill our hearts and our souls and our minds. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time. Thank you so much for being such a great God that we can serve you and we can honor you and we can learn about you and we will never, ever, 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 ever reach the end of you. You are truly a God worthy of honor and glory. And as we worship, Lord, please make the stuff of earth small. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to sing together. If you know the song, sing along. Remember, sing loud with abandon. I raise a hallelujah. In the presence of my enemies I raise a hallelujah Louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah My weapon is a melody I raise a hallelujah Love this line Cause heaven comes to fight for me I'm gonna sing In the middle of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roar Up from the ashes Hope will
is lipping. So if you had a hard time singing, you do it like this. Sing a little louder. Sing it back. Sing a little louder. 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 Okay, raise your voice. Here we go. Sing a little louder. In the presence of my enemies. Sing a little louder.
What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Your name is wonderful. Your name is beautiful Oh, there's no name in heaven or earth We bow before your throne Cause death could not hold you The veil tore before Silence the voices of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. You have no
to bow down out of love, out of adoration from our hearts, from our soul, from our mind to worship you because you are worthy of honor and glory and praise. <laughs> 